fantastic work on this so far. So we're really, really excited to have you here and perhaps to get the group a little bit up to speed. Um, so I think um, to locate you a little bit, welcome everyone uh, to another meeting of the Intelligent Corporation Group. Uh, thank you all for joining. Oh, for Audrey, I think um, maybe one cool thing for you to know is that most of the people here have a background in technology um, and uh, many of the um, people here are really, really interested in using technology to help humans and other intelligence cooperate better. So I think you can understand, uh, you can expect some technical uh, understanding here uh, in the group and I'm hoping for quite a fruitful uh, back and forth. But to bring all of you guys uh, who um, who we've been meeting now for the third month up to speed um, after I think we uh, really discussed a little bit what is driving cooperation and civilization at large um, uh, with great presentations by Vernon Smith, Andrew McAfee, Robert Axelrod and Tyler Cohen in the past few weeks. Uh, we are now moving on what it means to continue cooperation in the digital realm. And today we will uh, particularly investigate tools for openness and there really is no better person to do that with than uh, with Audrey Tang. So I'm really, really excited to have you here, Audrey. Um, Audrey is Taiwan's digital minister in charge of social innovation, open governance and youth engagement. Um, they are Taiwan's first transgender cabinet member and became the youngest minister in the country's history at the age of 35. And you have to tell us more about this, how you got headhunted by the Taiwanese president, I think in a sec. Um, and you're known really uh, well. It's easy, we just occupied the parliament for three weeks. We invited ourselves in, but go ahead. Okay, well, that's nice. Um, <laughs> uh, that's the way to go, I guess. And well, um, I think, yeah. Um, well, uh, so just to uh, perhaps like wrap this up before, uh, before I wanna leave the, the floor up to you, but you're really known for um, civic hacking and strengthening democracy using a variety of different technology tools. Um, you served on the Taiwanese National Development Council's Open Data Committee and are a really active contributor uh, to uh, GOF, which is uh, a community, I think the one that you were just referring to. Which... Mm -hmm. Gov Zero, yes. Yes. Gov Zero. Zero is not silent. Yeah, G Zero. No, not silent. <laughs> Um, and yeah, you really play, I think, a, a very key role in, uh, in, in Taiwan's also in, in Taiwan's COVID response. I've seen a few videos of how you found a few hilarious uh, ways, I think, to uh, to combat misinformation with humor. Um, and so thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and you suggested a really cool way, I think, to collect questions uh, for, from this group. And um, after a few uh, of my starting questions, three in particular, uh, we will just use that tool uh, and, and let that tool guide us. And so what I wanna do quickly is read out uh, to everyone here, a few of the questions that have already been submitted in the hope that this inspires uh, other people here in this group right now to open up this tool. And if you haven't done so yet, upload the questions that are, uh, that are on the tool that I shared with you via email. Um, okay, great. There it is already. <laughs> um, okay, well, so here we go. Now uh, we have um, questions of what can the different um, Asian approaches uh, to technology um, uh, learn from the US approach and vice versa? What techniques and tools that we found most useful for opening up Taiwan? How has COVID 19 affected the role of government and, and technologies in people's lives in Asia? When will we have an automated future? What to do to keep humans in the loop? What does it mean to be a conservative anarchist while working for the Taiwanese government? What have you found to be mo the most useful in helping people re-engage with their systems of governance? As surveillance technology becomes increasingly ubiquitous, what are the best ways to prevent it from being abused? What is the number one global t development or technology you're excited or worried about? What is the best uh, existing application of distributed ledgers? What is the worst? Is it true as acclaimed that the new China digital currency will enable individual identities to be private though transactions will be visible to the government. As global institutions continue to lose trust, which emerging attractors for non-coercive coordination do you find most promising? What does intelligent cooperation mean to you? And so on and so forth. I'm not gonna go through them all. This is really just to get uh, everyone here in this group who hasn't done so excited about uh, opening that tool up that I shared via email and actually uploading questions, okay? So you make sure that the question that you find most exciting uh, makes it to the front. And uh, please add your name so um, so you can ask them yourself. If your name's there, then I'll just try to call on you uh, here in the chat. Okay, well, um, I had a few questions prepared, but I think, um, you know, I think we should just go down that list um, and, and, and make sure that we hit, we hit them all and, and have more folks 
and develop them as, as they move in. So question number one, what can the different Asian approaches to technology learn from the US approach and vice versa? <laughs> I'm sure yeah. you're not, you don't get that question with the mm -hmm. first one. Right. Um, in, in Taiwan, uh, I think I'll quote Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, our president, when she became president first time in 2016, she said, uh, before we think of democracy as just showdown between two opposing values, but now democracy must be reimagined uh, to become a conversation between uh, diverse, many diverse values. Uh, and I think uh, whether you label this as the Asian approach or, or, or not, I think it's uh, just a, a matter of labeling, but really uh, we think about democracy differently because Taiwan is a very young democracy. Democracy. We had our first presidential election in 1996, which is already after the wild web. So much like, um, I don't know, Estonia and to a lesser extent Spain and so on. Uh, what we're seeing here is that we imagine democracy and internet as intertwined, as essentially the same thing. And so we talk about openly the um, bit rate of democracy, right? Uh, voting is like three bits per person every four years. Um, we talk about constitutional designs. We've got like six constitutional amendments. One is still uh, upcoming uh, and uh, just like a kernel of the operating system system, we're constantly tweaking it uh, to make sure that there is more bit rate uh, to listen at scale, for example. And all this uh, relies on this idea of uh, listening at scale enabled by end-to-end -end communications as shaped by internet technology, as opposed to the earlier democratic uh, substrata, which mostly run on, I don't know, pencil and paper. And uh, if you're, um, of course, goes to ancient Greek, then by uh, ancient stone tools uh, and things like that. So each generation of tool has a different imagination of tech. Uh, democracy and I think democracy as a form of social technology um, is our approach to technology it's not just about its industrial applications of natural science and things like that and US uh, because it's the you know original democratic experiment uh, many systems are still running on the uh, more ancient substrata uh, and I think uh, that's what uh, we can share a little bit about Thank you so much. Yeah, I think um, the, the next question ties in uh, nicely into that. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, what, uh, oh, well, it just got downvoted. But um, mm -hmm. I think, uh, what does it mean to be a conservative anarchist while working for the Taiwanese mm -hmm. government? No, it's not downvoted, it's highlighted. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm doing the highlighting. Um, so, um, yeah, would it, would it help if I, I uh, share this screen on another browser so that people can uh, look at the, or, or if you all have the slider open locally, then I, I won't bother uh, doing screen. Share. I think it's nice to see your face. Um, I, I shared okay. it just now in the chat again in the hope that. Oh, excellent. Okay, okay. I think people are. Um, okay, okay. Well, we'll, we'll just do this edge computing thing, right? And, and rely on your uh, browsers and your phones and so on. Uh, all right. So, um, yeah. Um, I, I use the term uh, anarchist uh, in its like pure meaning in that I don't give orders, I don't take orders. All the people who work with me uh, do so by voluntary association, not because they're coerced uh, to work in the space. Uh, and and this is the same as the core internet principles. Uh, it's called end-to-end uh, -end innovation. Uh, and I mean conservative by, well, respecting the traditions. That's what conservative means, right? Uh, in Taiwan, we have uh, 20 uh, or more national languages, many of which indigenous, uh, and we need to make improvements based on the rough consensus, again, a core internet value of these different cultures, instead of making quote-unquote progress on any particular culture to the detriment or sacrificing the other cultures. So that is to say, if we listen as scale across all those uh, cultural differences, then we, uh, just like Taiwan is literally caught between the Eurasian plate and the Philippine Sea plate when they bump into one another, uh, the tip of Taiwan, the Saviya, the Yushan mountain grows by two centimeters every year. Uh, and that to me speaks to this idea of conserving the, the two plates, uh, but then growing upward, skyward, uh, instead of in particular to the left wing or the right wing, I mean, tectonic plate wise. Um, and so that's my imagination. And, and I mean, I could also say I'm just a, um, you know, practically a, a Taoist, uh, but in the Western context, maybe we'll associate that with, I don't know, ritualistic, uh, spiritual uh, Taoism, which uh, I of course share some roots uh, with, but I mean it, in a very practical way. Uh, so I, I hope that explains a little bit of what conservative anarchists mean. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, part of uh, the subtitle in the book is Intelligent Voluntary Cooperation. So I think, you know, mm -hmm. uh, one of the principles that uh, we rely on is mm -hmm. this voluntary association, which is also mm -hmm. part of how this group came, came about, actually. 
Uh, yeah, and, and just for the record, I don't work for the Taiwanese government. I work with the Taiwanese government. Uh, I don't work for the people. I work with the people. Uh, otherwise, uh, I, I'm, I cannot call myself anarchist in good conscience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, that's a, that's a great qualification, actually. And um, okay, well, uh, moving on to the next one, what techniques and tools have you found most useful for opening up uh, Taiwan this far? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, one uh, particularly useful idea is called radical tr transparency. Like, uh, I understand that you're uh, recording this conversation. I'm going to ask a copy to publish to the commons. Uh, and usually we publish either the video or the transcript after 10 days of co-editing. And this is the condition of all the visits uh, to me, including lobbyists, journalists, and, and things like that. And I discovered that this is a, a really good quality uh, of conversation because people are going to be mindful that uh, generations down the line is going to watch this video or transcript. Uh, and so uh, we tend not to make arguments uh, that will uh, benefit the current generation at the expense of future generation or younger generations because they, they are watching in a sense. Uh, but uh, if we uh, do closed door private meetings and so on, then uh, more often than not, people will propose something for short term gain uh, at a long term loss, right? So uh, I think this uh, intergenerational um, solidarity is built upon this idea of radical transparency and, and us contributing to the commons, not just the what of policies made, but also the why and the how of policy making. And that also tends to include people who are not yet 18 years old, so that they don't have to, you know, um, I don't know, go to strike on Fridays with all due respect, but they can uh, read uh, the, the context around which uh, the policy suggestions are made and start, say, citizen initiatives, uh, collecting petitions uh, on the uh, government sponsor Sponsored, uh, public infrastructure join the GOV.TW and once they get 5,000 signatures the policy actually change and we run collaboration uh, meetings with them even if they are uh, immigrants or non-citizen residents or very young people who have, doesn't have the right to vote they're not excluded uh, from the hearing and now and again radical transparency helps uh, with communicating the context. Do, do you ever think um, there is something to be said for a timed release so you know mm -hmm. after you know like let's say 10 to 15 yeah, sure. minutes, sure. Yeah, uh, because uh, people, of course, during conversations, sometimes we talk about anecdotes of our friends uh, who have not cleared this uh, for publication. So it, it has a kind of privacy uh, protection mechanism built in for this 10 days of co-editing. And so, yeah, people do uh, go back to the transcript and anonymize uh, or de-identify a certain part of their speech. But of course, uh, each person is responsible for their segments uh, in a speech. So in the more extreme cases, for example, uh, I had a conversation with a senior leader leadership team uh, of a certain corporation called Microsoft, uh, and uh, they decided to de-identify themselves very thoroughly, uh, so you don't see anything. Uh, and if you look at the transcript, which I pasted on the chat here, uh, then you can see that uh, it just the interviewer speaks, uh, and you can't uh, de-identify uh, de and find out which senior leadership uh, person in Microsoft said what. Uh, but everything I said is still radically open. So, so at the most extreme cases, uh, they can, I guess, do that that uh, trade secret or whatever other concerns, uh, but uh, my side at least uh, is contextualized. Didn't that kick off a Barbara Streisand effect? Um, well, the fact that I'm bringing this up as no, a, you know, you <laughs> it means that uh, I'm intentionally uh, using the Barbara Streisand effect, which uh, may actually render the effect mood right, paradoxical prescription. That, that may or may not work, yeah, depending on whether you share it, I guess. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, I, I, I guess uh, Eric Drexler, who um, uh, I think uh, well, co-founded Foresight and, and uh, many people here in this group know and, and, and cherish a lot, uh, he once said that you know if if let's say for example a government was saying that it could only have uh, that it has to have um, that it has to keep information private, you could perhaps have something like a clause of like okay time release and like let's say mm -hmm. 15, many years, then at least you are now discussing time horizon. Mm -hmm. You can bargain them down rather than just mm -hmm. having a blanket statement on that. So it was more like a foot mm -hmm. in the door and then opening it up. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we have the similar uh, arrangement in our national secret laws and our Freedom of Information Acts and so on. But the fact is that the internet uh, enabled the communities to work on faster iterations. So the reason why it's 10 days and not 10 years uh, is uh, basically otherwise uh, we're on this very long iteration cycle. But the people in the social sector and the economic sector are already uh, doing agile spread in like 10 days or is uh, 14 days or seven days cycles uh, and that uh, will render the public sector irrelevant unless we respond in a similar iteration cycle. Yeah. 
Well done. Okay. Well, let's uh, move down the list as, as questions get reshuffled. Um, as surveillance technology becomes increasingly ubiquitous, what are the best ways to prevent it from being abused? Mm -hmm. Well, it will uh, be abused. Uh, there's no getting around that. You can't prevent it uh, from being abused. Uh, but uh, I think what's important here is to make sure that the, the abuse of the surveillance technology is not the norm. That is to say, it is called out and it is stopped uh, by popular demand. And in order to effect such a popular demand, uh, one needs to uh, have feasible alternatives. Uh, one example, uh, uh, in Taiwan, uh, during the height of the COVID, which for us was last April. It's been like 10 months with no COVID. But anyway, uh, last April, we had a uh, scare where uh, the uh, hostess, a hostess from the hostess bar in the nightlife district uh, get an exos COVID-19. And for the first day, she didn't tell the contact tracers. Uh, she said that she remained at home. Uh, on the second day, she finally uh, said, you know, I want to preserve the anonymity uh, of my <clears throat> patrons. Now, uh, a an, any other uh, East Asian jurisdiction will probably say, you know, agree to uh, stay surveillance or uh, be put into jail or fine a lot because this is uh, endangering public health, right? Uh, but we didn't do that. Uh, instead, we uh, co-created with the Nala District this idea of participatory self-surveillance where uh, the patrons uh, only need to enter a like throwaway SIM card number, SMS number, or a throwaway, I don't know, proto mail uh, email address, uh, making sure that they could be contacted without leaving their real names. And if uh, this is like literally on, on pieces of paper, which are shredded after four weeks of no local transmission in that particular business place, and that uh, never needs to be sent to any local health authorities or to the Central Epidemic Command Center uh, in the national government. So in that sense, we didn't drive them underground um, as, for example, the prohibition did in the US, uh, but rather uh, uh, con concluded that if we federate, if we decentralized uh, this survey uh, in a way that is still appropriate with the privacy norms of those uh, non-life businesses, then they, can, they too can be part of the uh, response team to counter coronavirus right. because we trust the people more. We expect people to trust each other more uh, as well. But without this feasible alternative co-created, um, I am sure that uh, out of popular demand will succumb uh, to the state surveillance imposes. So this uh, system of co-creation of real-time feedback is really important, especially when the times uh, calls for like testing of these principles. Wow, so it was proto mail and uh, then like just like a paper trail or? Yeah, uh, you, you basically uh, buy a prepaid SIM uh, card, uh, which is uh, not linked to your other phone and you frequent a host bar or hostess bar and just leave that number and not any of your names or, or handles or whatever. And, and that enabled uh, the contact tracer to find you if they need to find you while preserving your anonymity. And this is then shredded after uh, four weeks and at which time you can just delete that ProtoMail account or just throw away that prepaid SIM card. Wow, and were there any problems with that, or did it run uh, rather smooth? Mm, no, uh, the the uh, nightclubs uh, resume operation uh, after just a few weeks after this idea of what we call real contact system uh, is uh, implemented, and we don't have uh, any outbreaks. And uh, compare nearby jurisdictions in East Asia, which uh, did drive the nightlife district underground, and they actually had the second or third wave uh, because of this uh, like underground activities. Well, okay. Well, that's a good segue into the next question, which is um, how has COVID-19 affected the role of government and tech in people's lives in Asia? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I would first say that it uh, really justified uh, encroachment uh, on privacy. Uh, it justified a lot of state surveillance uh, and it made a lot of new norms uh, which are not necessarily healthy for the health of um, social sector, unfortunately. Uh, but in Taiwan, we, we countered the pandemic with no lockdown. So we escaped the, the worst of it because we did not have to uh, instate a state of emergency where the administration get to do pretty much anything and for the legislature to forgive them later, right? We, we didn't have that. Everything we did, uh, it need to be preordained uh, by the legislature and we never invent new data collection touch points uh, during the pandemic using pandemic as a justification. So this is very similar of how we fought the infodemic with no administrative takedown um, because people remember the martial law. They actually remember the 2003 SARS experience where a lockdown of the hospital leaves everyone traumatized so we don't want to go back there. But Taiwan is probably an outlier here uh, for most Asian jurisdictions we do see because of the takedowns and the lockdowns, the state surveillance and concentration of power uh, became increased and democracy have uh, just um, 
declined or, or decimated, like literally cut by 10% uh, in many jurisdictions. Uh, cut by 10%, could you elaborate on that? Like, like, like um, I'm referring to the uh, Freedom House, uh, Freedom uh, Indexes and, and things like that. They, uh, the latest report and also Economist has a recent report uh, that says the degree of democracy, like from fully democratic to partial democracy and so on. The number of uh, fully open or fully democratic countries, uh, especially in our corner of the world, have uh, declined uh, by about 10%, uh, which is, is a, is a um, like, uh, joke because decimate uh, reduced by 10%. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, well, the next one is on um, new uh, China digital currency. And that one, not for me. Is it from anyone else here? And if so, would you like to ask it yourself? Sure, Otherwise, I could ask. Yeah, I could please ask. go ahead. Hi. Um, hey. <clears throat> I was listening to, uh, to another online uh digital currency event and the claim was that china's digital currency will preserve individual privacy but not transactional privacy and i uh i can't understand what that means and do you know anything about this can you explain it does it even make sense well uh from what i understand um if you participate in a public ledger system say bitcoin or ethereum uh, the idea is that the wallet number uh, is public for everyone to see but the wallet number can or can be linked to you or it could be uh, somehow remixed and not uh, linked to you uh, and there's a series of ways uh, to distance yourself so to speak uh, uh, with varying um, difficulties uh, to a certain wallet address so in that i don't don't think there is anything that's uh, uncommon uh, about these ideas but of course because in the PRC that's people Republic of China uh, regime um, the very act of using uh, cryptography or the very act of logging into the public internet uh, requires a real name identification uh, and sometimes with the face recognition stuff uh, and so I think the state if uh, it wanted uh, could always very reliably re-identify individuals but it may be possible that the uh, customer cannot uh, re-identify the seller for example during a transaction that's certainly possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question, in case you don't want to remain anonymous, but want to ask it yourself uh, about helping people re-engage with their systems. Okay. Um, now, I think what, what's uh, most useful uh, is to trust the citizens and <clears throat> apologize swiftly uh, if they find out that a mistake has been done uh, and show some real competence by inviting them to then uh, work on better uh, alternative. Uh, for example, um, during the pandemic, we had this idea of publishing the real-time availability of medical masks in pharmacies. And initially, our National Health Insurance Agency published just in you know regular tables uh, on their uh, website and so on, but nobody has the time to, to look at uh, PDF files or the Excel, or, sorry, open document uh, tables. Uh, but on the other hand, there's uh, civic hackers that invented ways uh, to just show on OpenStreetMap, Google Map, and things like that, uh, a visualization of nearby pharmacies. And in real time, because uh, when you swipe your national health card uh, queuing in line, then the person queuing after you can refresh their phone and very quickly see that it depletes by two, or nowadays by 10 by 10 with each purchase. So it's like a um, participatory uh, accountable distributed ledger with more than 100 different systems uh, tracking it. But when this happened, uh, the pharmacies uh, also independently invented this idea of take a number system where uh, they collect the IC card for healthcare, but didn't uh, hand out and put the mask immediately. They tell you, take this number, go back in the evening. And they processed uh, the card swiping during the lunch break. Uh, but on the map, this broke the map because then uh, you see it sells nothing. At the lunch break, it sells everything. <laughs> And so the map become not useful uh, to the point where the pharmacies near uh, my household actually put on the uh, shelf window saying, don't trust the app, uh, exclamation mark. Uh, and so, um, I mean, in an in a authoritarian top-down regime, what we will do is punish one side or the other, right? <laughs> and, and just encourage one social innovation while uh, destroying the other. But because uh, we're a thoroughly open, radically open um, polity, uh, I, I just literally stepped into the pharmacy, uh, took a deep breath. Yeah. 
course, uh, and 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 ask, you know, what would you do if you are the digital minister? My my favorite question. Uh, and the uh, pharmacist uh, consulted with their online group and discovered that they can actually hack the system by uh, inputting if you uh, receive uh, a certain set of mask uh, as a pharmacist, you can actually input negative 500 or negative 1000, in which case the stock availability become negative. Uh, and then you disappear from the map because we didn't handle the negative values. And so they, they invented this kind of cloaking uh, device uh, by essentially uh, white hat hacking the system. And so we immediately institutionalized that and put a button in. So the time uh, they spent uh, handing out the numbers, uh, after that time, they just push a, a button and they disappear from the map. So the map uh, auto calibrates itself and so on. And so when the legislator later on used this uh, case and real-time API uh, to interpolate Minister Chen Shizhong saying, uh, uh, look, uh, you. Uh, I, I know that you think it's fair because population center overlap um, with the distribution of pharmacies is actually unfair uh, because the urban people don't have to spend as much time as rural people on public transportation to reach the nearby pharmacies. So there's this uh, Taipei city based bias uh, baked in. And by pointing this out and suggesting a better distribution method, uh, like 24 hour pre-ordering and collecting at convenience stores, the minister didn't have to defend uh, our policy. Uh, he just said, you know, legislation later teach us. And then we worked with the MP uh, who was VP of data analytics at Foxconn Group. So she really knows something about data uh, and the community on a new distribution mechanism just 24 hours after her interpolation. So I hope these two anecdotes showed uh, a swift apology and a competent response saying, okay, your idea will become policy next week, uh, shows how people really would then re-engage with the system of government because there's instant gratification. Thank you so much. Yeah, Danny, your questions next. Hey, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Uh, so my question was originally, well, it, it's about um, uh, making a trade-off between radical transparency and individual privacy. And you already mm -hmm. gave one example with the radical privacy of Microsoft. Um, but I, I think I can broaden this out a little bit and ask about when you're using uh, uh, public data, public sector data, which of course is about the citizens, and then you run into this problem of like you end up exposing data about citizens. So if you show um, the patterns of, uh, of, of behavior or whatever, you're actually revealing something about individuals. And where do you think that trade-off should lie and what heuristics are you using? To mm -hmm. make those decisions. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, uh, we make a very strong uh, delineation between open data uh, and real-time open data, open API, uh, with uh, private data. And uh, what we are looking at is, for example, the civil IoT system in Taiwan, uh, sci.taiwan.gov.tw, collects real-time sensor data crowdsourced by, say, primary schoolers using air boxes to measure in their classroom the PM 2.5 air quality value, the water quality values, and things like that in a distributed ledger. And so that teaches people the importance of data stewardship uh, and what we call data competence, not literacy. Literacy is when you're a consumer, right? Uh, competence is when you're making your own narratives. And of course, the rivers and mountains um, doesn't have privacy concerns, I guess. <laughs> and so it's okay for the primary schoolers <laughs> to do measurements there. But uh, by participating in such data coalitions, uh, data collaboratives, uh, the young people also learned that uh, there could be bias, right? There could be uh, like um, the things that's used to analyze outside of its original collected purpose. Uh, there could be a data pipeline uh, problems. Uh, there could be issues uh, in the like different resolutions uh, of collection materials and so on. So they become more sensitive, more aware of the issues that could happen to them uh, if uh, the private data is measured, analyzed this way and bias introduced. But they then have the vocabulary to correct uh, these things when uh, pointed out as well. So this is a little little bit like, I, I don't know, teaching the safe use of fire, responsive uh, use of fire, responsible use of fire at a tender age of six by, I don't know, offering cooking classes, sharing recipes uh, and things like that. So, so this is the, the baseline. And then uh, on top of that, we, we have, 
uh, a uh, EU compatible, basically pre GDPR European privacy law. Uh, in Taiwan, we are seeking GDPR adequacy. Uh, the Independent Data Protection Authority is the last missing piece, and we're working on it uh, this uh, legislative session. And so, with this idea, then we need to focus uh, for the private data ways to. Uh, enhance privacy by default by, for example, uh, using federated and split learning to share the insights about particular data collection points without revealing the raw data, or about, for example, for cybersecurity, homomorphic encryption to make sure that our National Center for High-Speed Computation can do the calculation computation for you without peeking into the data. Mathematically speaking, cannot peek into the data. And people are more robust because they learn as part of data competence classes that they, they could could be, for example, zero knowledge range proofs that allows marathon uh, hosts to uh, define a range of uh, health conditions uh, for the eligible marathon players and for the National Health Insurance Agency to attest to that using zero knowledge proofs without revealing any of their diagnostics uh, materials and so on. So again, viable alternatives that renders the old bad zero sum trade offs uh, obsolete, a very Buckminster Fullerian uh, thought, right? A build new system to render old obsolete instead of trying to fight that old battle. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, lovely. Um, uh, great. Lovely. Thank you so much. And we have next one, Esteban. Oh, yeah. So I was wondering if uh, you were able, if you ever looked at some sort of liquid democracy um, at any scale, the, the idea that even though I don't know anything about health, the Minister of Health of a country may be both uh, elected by uh, the collection of votes of uh, people to whom other people have delegated their votes. For example, I will delegate it to my MD or whatever. Uh, or um, what would be the challenges that you may see um, some sort of system like that. To me, liquid democracy delegating to specific people requires you to maintain constant contact uh, with the said people, and, and that makes scaling quite challenging. Uh, and so the experiments we did is mostly voting for topics instead of voting for people, which to me uh, requires less cognitive burden uh, to maintain a weak link to like 10 topics, right? So I may join like 10 different e-petitions and each one collecting support from more than 5,000 uh, signatures and they receive constant feedback when the ministers hold collaboration meetings with the petitioner, but it doesn't require me to delegate uh, to the petitioner anything else than that particular topic. And because of that, I don't need to uh, do, you know, constant interpolation <laughs> to the petitioner to, to assess their uh, expertise in other uh, things as well. So to me, uh, a, a faster iteration, a faster feedback is the main uh, thing that I'm looking for. So because of that, the liquidity <laughs> of democracy as measured by the effective bit rate. And sometimes the liquid democracy delegate serve as bottlenecks uh, of such uh, principal agent problem configurations. So uh, truth to be told, I, I use more quadratic voting, uh, quadratic funding, uh, participatory budgeting, uh, things like that, that um, builds a many-to-many -many system where people uh, choose the topic they care about, contribute, and everybody feel they have won because there's synergy. And if you support seven projects, Project with synergies, chances are one or two of them are bound to happen anyway. Uh, and instead of liquid democracy, uh, pure delegates, because that still uh, has this issue like 49% of people feeling they have lost when their favorite candidate didn't win an argument. You're already using quadratic funding, and like what, what uh, kind of, uh -huh. like, what kinds yeah, we, of things work mm -hmm. well and what doesn't work well? Mm -mm. Yeah, um, so I, I'm digital minister uh, tw slash board member radical exchange, right? So <laughs> in, in radical exchange board votes, uh, we use quadratic voting already. Uh, and after trying it, it out for a, a couple of times, uh, we then transfer it, I think a couple of years ago, we're on the third year now, using quadratic voting uh, for presidential hackathon. And for the hackathon, which the trophy is 
um, a projector that projects the president handing you the trophy. So it's meta trophy subscribing. Uh, there's no prize money, uh, but the five winners uh, each year get a presidential promise that uh, their idea, their small scale, minimal viable process uh, will become public policy within the next year as if it's a executive order from the president. So it's binding power from the presidential office as a hackathon prize. Uh, so how to qualify uh, the projects that receive the coaching needed uh, to achieve uh, this presidential hackathon um, championship where well, we use the weight of uh, SDGs, the global goals, uh, 169 targets, and each idea, uh, each collaboration need to correspond to one or more of the SDG targets. And then we display this palette of SDG, like all 17 colors uh, to the uh, voters uh, and anyone on the joint platform, which constantly have around 10 million visitors out of country of 23 million, a lot of people, and each person has uh, 99 uh, points to, to vote. Now in uh, uh, normal <laughs> internet voting, people get mobilized to vote everything to the same uh, candidate without looking at other candidate and they, they close the window. That's the usual pattern of behavior. Uh, but using quadratic voting, uh, we enable people to, well, still get mobilized, but when they vote, they discover with 99 points, they cannot vote uh, 10 votes. Uh, because it's quadratic, right? One vote, one point, two vote, four point, three votes, nine points, four votes, 16 points. So with 99 points, one can only vote 81 points into nine votes to your favorite subject, and you still have 18 left. So people are motivated to look at something else, and maybe they vote four, and they still have two points left. So they're motivated to look at least at four projects, and sometimes people discover synergy, so they take some back and do a seven and seven and things like that. So on average, people vote for five to like eight different projects projects and they discover those uh, synergies by themselves, learning more about global goals uh, on the process. And so when the top 20 or 24 are selected, it's much easier for us to find which teams that didn't make the cut can actually join the uh, teams that did make the cut and the voters feel that they um, win nevertheless, because one of the teams that they support now absorbing some of the, the other teams uh, now makes the cut and become uh, the uh, president approved uh, trophy winners and so on. So so um, we can uh, look into, for example, the, uh, the midpoint between pure grant making and pure crowdfunding uh, and quadratic funding is somewhere in the middle. And we're now working uh, with the social investment committees in an upcoming social innovation summit uh, to design that for the impact based investment. So that's still in the future. But the quadratic voting is in the past is work really well in the past uh, couple of years. And this year is no exception. Wow. OK. Um, and. Is there also a way for um, folks to potentially propose um, mm -hmm. things they can get voted on, or is it just SDG? Yeah. Also, have yeah. you heard well, at yeah, all you, about? Yeah, you, you, you can you can propose anything, but you have to yeah. find a SDG target that it fulfills, uh, because then it measures the the common good part of it. Okay, interesting. Have you heard at all about uh, DAO democracy uh, proposed by mm -hmm. Ralph Parker, who was, uh, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. thinking uh, Robin Hanson's future key a little bit further? And mm -hmm. are there any other types of governance mechanisms that you'd be excited about, or what do you think about that particular one? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, to me, democracy is a form of technology. So as, I'm, as a technologist, I'm, I'm uh, equally excited <laughs> about uh, each and every new governance uh, proposes and mechanisms. And I think uh, blockchain governance, the, the Ethereum and other communities provides a, a really good uh, testing ground to, to make some of the governance uh, principles uh, shine uh, forth or not shine. Uh, in the case of Gitcoin experiments, we have seen many uh, like um, issues uh, like and uh, necessity or non-necessity is still debated of negative votes uh, and things like that. But when, when it converges a little bit and ready uh, for um, mass deployment, then Taiwan is here uh, to help uh, because we then transfer the ideas that are more mature into our everyday governance. Thank you. Uh, this is just a brief reminder for everyone that I posted the link for upvoting and downvoting questions into the chat. So if you can't find it in the email, then it's in the chat. And you still have time to bump some questions up uh, in the final 20 minutes uh, of your end. Oh, someone just did. <laughs> um, OK, great. So we have a next new question, a new next question, which is your Wikipedia page mentions that you had been working on sharing economy software. Can you speak more about your work on this? Yeah, I wonder who wrote that um, part, though, because we're not allowed to edit our own Wikipedia page. I, I really don't know what, what that refers to. I, I actually, uh, my uh, guess is that the software called Polis, a AI-assisted conversation tool that uh, did 
uh, get the regulation done by uh, the people, crowdsourced by the people uh, in 2015 about UberX and later on about Airbnb and later on about platform economy in general, maybe what the Wikipedia writer uh, is referring to. And so this system, very simply put, uh, is a AI system that makes it very easy for people to discover their commonalities despite their ideological differences. Because when UberX came to Taiwan in 2015, uh, a lot of people uh, get caught into the ideological debate of whether it's a sharing economy, whether it's just gig economy, whether this is platform economy or, or whatever, right? Uh, but what people care about really um, is the, the fairness uh, and the um, idea that this must not, for example, harm the um, insurance for the people sitting in the back seat uh, and things like that. But these do not get as much coverage. So we build our own pro-social social media, not the anti-social ones. Uh, and nowadays it's digital public infrastructure, polis.gov.tw, thoroughly free software, um, Afro GPL. Uh, and in 2015, this is the actual map of the clusters of my friends and family who are all over the place uh, about uh, what they feel about UberX. And so basically we crowdsource the facts, we share the facts, uh, for three weeks, we ask about people's feelings. Um, and then the best idea that take care of people's willings, feelings become the regulation. So one feeling may be passenger liability insurance very important. And if you agree with me, then your avatar moves a little bit toward me. But if you do not agree with me, then your avatar moves away from me. This is k-means clustering. And the two axes are dynamically calculated using principal component analysis. And then people are motivated to propose their own feelings for other people to vote on. And surprisingly, these ideological differences are just a very few percent. And most people agree with most of each other, uh, most of the things, most of the time. This is a true um, shape of democracy, but uh, in the more anti-social corner of social media, uh, something flipping <laughs> is shown uh, to people because, I don't know, because the private anti-social social media is sometimes like a nightclub where people have to shout to be heard with addictive drinks, private bouncers, and, and all that. Uh, there, there's, a, there's room for a nightlife district, uh, but we do a public deliberation on public squares. So this is a public square, and we get the consensus around registration, about not undercutting existing meters, and so on. And then we have a very fair and balanced uh, platform economy law uh, for multi-purpose taxi drivers that includes existing co-ops and companies, and individual taxi drivers, in a way that ensures fairness while allow things like surge pricing and so on to be introduced to the market, and so on. So that may be what the Wikipedia writer is referring to, but it's not not a sharing economy software, it's an AI software for public deliberation about sharing economy. <laughs> Very nice. Okay, thanks. Um, and uh, I guess this one's also a good piggyback one. What technologies that may be under people's radar, um, you know, especially on this on this call, would you like to see developed or used more? And uh, if, if they aren't, then what's stopping uh, them from being used or developed? Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, just this, this very idea of democracy as a type of technology, that you can increase the bit rate of democracy by introducing not necessarily new representative democratic voting system, which may be difficult, but rather the uh, basic idea of, say, presidential hackathon, which is compatible with any form of representational democracy, right? Uh, sandbox applications, um, the e-petition, as I mentioned, and participatory budgeting and things like that. So that the idea of democracy as a technology, and you can develop it without destroying the old generation of democracy, you can even build some API uh, to, to for back, uh, backward or bugward uh, compatibility. Uh, I think that thought itself is quite uh, under people's radars, and I would uh, wish more people could work on it. And I think what's stopping uh, this vision be developed is that people sometimes uh, has this um, idea that career public service is resistant to change. It's not true. Uh, the career public servants that I in interacted across the world are all for change if the change could save their time and reduce their risk. So if you frame your innovations as a time-saving risk-reducing tool, then you may find surprising allies in the public sector. And perhaps if you reframe your work relationship as working with the government. <laughs> not for that's them. right, that's right, <laughs> as opposed to working for the government, that's exactly right. Uh, okay, great. Next one. As global institutions continue to lose trust, which emerging, emerging attractors for non-coercive coordination do you find most promising? Mm 
Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think uh, this idea about uh, data coalitions, uh, about people now more and more see that if I take a selfie with my friends and upload it uh, to a extractive surveillance capitalist, uh, then I'm essentially giving up the negotiation power of my friends, uh, selling them out, so to speak. Uh, I think this is capturing people's attention and people are forming um, variously called data trust, data intermediary, data coalitions, or data collaboratives uh, to address uh, this this very issue. So I think this is something that uh, I find very exciting because when people get into the mood of a cooperative movement, they may, may not call it a co-op or credit union, but that means that people spend more time thinking about governance instead of just passively uh, succumbing uh, to the state or capitalist uh, surveillance. So uh, more active participation in data coalitions, I think this is the most promising in the near future for me. And what are uh, specific data coalitions that are forming? Mm -hmm. In Taiwan, yeah. right? in Taiwan, for example, uh, more than five, I think six million people now have downloaded an app that will uh, let you <clears throat> um, authorize your national health insurance records through, say, zero knowledge proofs uh, and other ways to integrate with SDKs uh, to better uh, understand the cohort of people who, for example, suffer from diabetes and, and uh, form a theory of change uh, or to uh, find out uh, um, heat uh, damage, heat strokes. And and so on as a result of climate change without um, you know divulging your private details or actually um, well let's not get anyone the most uh, active uh, participated uh, data collision is none of these uh, but rather about dedicating medical mask uh, quota to international humanitarian aid uh, that particular uh, program had more than uh, 75 uh, 760, I think 760,000 citizens uh, participating, which collectively dedicated more than 8 million medical masks uh, for international humanitarian aid uh, by people refraining to collect their uh, quota from the pharmacy. Go to this app and say, I want to dedicate a quota I didn't collect in the past couple of weeks to international humanitarian aid in exchange for a non-fungible token <laughs> of their name being displayed <laughs> on this, this wall uh, of uh, like um, people who care about uh, international humanitarian assistance. Uh, and, and you can check the, the wall for, for yourself. And my name is even on it. Uh, and my Mandarin name anyway. Uh, and this uh, has um, turned into a, a real uh, social media game and people, uh, including popular YouTubers and, and things like that, it really raised the awareness uh, about the shortage of PPEs, the uh, need for uh, self-manufactured uh, mask plants uh, around the world uh, and things like that. And, and it really uh, also reminded people that masks are there for you know protecting our own face against our own unwashed hands and so on. So it serves many, many purposes and the engagement rate is really high. Thank you, lovely. Um, what's the best existing application of distributed ledger and what's the worst? I don't know. I, I've never met a application I didn't like, so <laughs> I don't know if there's a bad application of distributed ledgers. Um, I think uh, just like, I don't know, this like asking, you know, what's your favorite relational database application? Uh, I can think of quite a few. Uh, and I don't think they are in a competitive relationship to, to one another. I think each application fosters newer, uh, exciting uh, applications of new innovations. So, so I don't really have a favorite, so to speak. Lovely. Uh, what's the uh, who who asked the next question on anarchist thinkers? Who is it? Anyone here in the audience that want to ask it themselves? Okay, then I'll ask it. <laughs> Which okay. anarchist thinkers do you recommend? <laughs> Uh, okay, I, I usually uh, begin my day uh, reading a little bit uh, from the Tao Te Ching, right? The, the Lao Tzu. And I, if you speak English, which you probably do, I, I recommend the Ursula K. Le Guin, uh, anarchist herself, uh, translation of the, the ancient uh, Taoist uh, classical scripture uh, in a uh, contemporary um, poetic form. Uh, and of the contemporary thinkers, uh, I'm quite influenced by uh, Kojin Karatani, a Japanese anarchist and uh, associationist thinker. So uh, also check out his books. I think it's been translated to English. Oh, awesome. Thank you. OK, again, a reminder, people, that there's still a few questions moving up and down. So if you want to get the last 10 minutes, your questions upvoted, then go on the chat open up uh, the voting tool and uh, and start uploading questions. I think there's still some movement, so uh, there's, there's still time. Mm -hmm. um, 
when will we have an automated future and what and uh, can we do to keep humans in the loop we already have a automated presence i mean a lot of the work that we do even in this very chat are automated right i, I don't remember hand tallying your votes on slido that's entirely automated so <laughs> um, i think uh, the, the the trick is to automate away things that we don't want to do uh, and to focus on things that require people-to-people -people, um, connections um, because we collaborate much better if we don't want uh, don't spend time uh, on the you know chores to enable the collection uh, collaboration to happen at the first place if we have to manually um, you know um, count the votes um, and of course we can do humming IETF style but assuming that uh, we, we just uh, are very vocal uh, and just take turns speaking out uh, yay or nay uh, on each question asked not only this is very time consuming but it will not scale uh, very well beyond say five people right so so scaling better the communication and automating our way the chores that um, you know when anyone uh, counts the votes it's probably going to be the same thing so the vote counting part could probably be automated but the deliberation to get this agenda on the table in the first place to find the facilitated space where people can converge on the common ideas and values despite their initially different positions that's an art and what's an art uh, probably requires human in the loop and could not be that easily automated uh, or at least it could be automated to much detriment and so we don't do that. Oh, interesting. And what do you think of recent GPT-3 advances? Any, anything mm -hmm. that you thought was yeah. overhyped or? Well, it's it's an it, it's a inspiring art form, right? It's this complete this sentence uh, art form. Uh, and uh, as a as a poetician, uh, I think it inspires poetry. Uh, but if you expect a poet to be your I don't know local clinic doctor or something, that's asking too much from poets. All right, thanks. Chris, do you want to ask you a question? Chris, you got upvoted on the democracy bit. Do you want to ask it yourself in case you're here in the, uh, in the conversation? Sure, sure. Um, so I think you mentioned a few times that, uh, something about bitrate of democracy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd be interested in you giving a slightly longer explanation mm -hmm. of what you had in mind there. Sure. Um, so I refer to voting as around three bits per person every four years uh, uploaded, right? So that's a very concrete bit rate. Anyone can calculate uh, the bit rate of democracy by uh, thinking about the choices, the public choices that we make uh, and the frequency that we make it. And these two together, uh, I guess, also a lot of uh, ineffective voting and, and noise in public uh, choices and so on. But you, you can, of course, calculate rather easily the bit rate. Uh, as we can compare that uh, with, say, Slido, which determines literally the agenda setting. It determines the agenda <laughs> of this particular conversation. But uh, while I'm speaking, you don't have to wait for me to stop speaking you can with your own phone uh, or other computing devices to do upvoting and you're not limited by the number of the questions that you could upvote so if you have a uh, vote like five uh, different agenda in this conversation your bit rate is already much higher uh, when measured in the kind of time from you doing this upvote and me actually talking about this agenda as a result of your upvote this is a much shorter iteration cycle and therefore a higher bit rate so, so it's kind of a measure of the level of agency yes. uh, of, in the aggregate for the population of democracy. Yes, definitely. Uh, and for example, polis, which enable people to resonate or not uh, with one another, uh, is has a much higher bit rate than, say, a predefined survey uh, or a poll. Because in a poll, uh, people are only doing uh, selections. So each selection, like one out of four selections, that's just two bits. But uh, during a polis conversation, each person can actually write in 140 letters uh, for other people to resonate or not. And so those 140 letters there is already much higher than any polls or surveys that we have entered because it's qualitatively different. Okay, thank you. Uh, how is technology changing currently the global offense defense balance? Mm -hmm. Well, um, that's 
I really don't know about that because um, I only work with the people who voluntarily associate with me and they know that I'm working in the radical transparency way. So while my office do have secondments or dispatches from around 12 ministries related uh, to, I don't know, culture, public communication, public diplomacy, uh, education, uh, you name it, uh, we do not have any uh, defense uh, ministry people in my office. I Maybe they're not that uh, cool with radical transparency. So I know nothing about military uh, and I don't really um, have any context to answer this uh, beyond what, what everybody read in the news. Thank you. Okay. Um, so what do you think is the uh, number one uh, global uh, development or technology that you're super excited or super worried about? <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm uh, excited uh, about, as I mentioned, uh, the idea of data collisions, uh, data collaboratives, uh, international um, endeavors that uh, already helped us to counter the pandemic uh, via joint research uh, and now are increasingly turning the attention on, say, solving climate change, solving the infodemic uh, and things like that, which is all, all great. Uh, I'm, I'm worried about uh, this tendency uh, to attribute to a failure of democracy uh, whenever something uh, bad happens happens that couldn't get addressed quick enough by democratic polities uh, and people sometimes praise authoritarian models and say uh, that they made the necessary sacrifice of freedom and liberty uh, so that they can recover economy wise or recover public health wise and so on it's a quite popular rhetoric in in the past year or so now of course taiwan is the living proof that you you can have both right both liberty freedom um, the human right, democracy, and economic growth, public health, and so on. So I think that need to be more widely known. Uh, and also, I think we are able to do that precisely because we're a democratic polity, and people learn from the very traumatic experience in SARS in 2003, which is why we institutionalized, while the memory was still fresh, uh, all the SARS playbook that we played this time to much, much success. So one of the things about democracy is that it's resilient, and whatever it learns is in the memory of the people, not just a few elites uh, that does the decisions so more democracy uh, it would be my prescription not less democracy just because democracy uh, didn't perform that well on one particular pandemic or the other and perhaps friction also is back not as feature uh -huh. um, uh, mm -hmm. okay well someone who has the next question on the experimenting with democracy uh, tech do you want to ask it yourself if it's yours no okay well I'll... okay yeah who uh, is it yeah. Um, I was just saying, so let's say I'm working, I'm in blockchain or I'm working mm -hmm. on um, novel DAOs or mm -hmm. democracy. Mm -hmm. and, I'm interested in, and I think my thing is mature and cool. Uh, okay. I'm interested in working with Taiwan around okay. you know, trying it out. How do I do that? Uh, come and visit, become a resident. Uh, we have a open permit uh, that uh, allows you to work for your own company. It doesn't have to be a Taiwanese one uh, or for yourself. Uh, digital nomad is just fine and stay for three years with tax benefits, high salaries. Um, you know, bring your family, your parents and grandparents can visit too and you enjoy universal health care even amid COVID and you can like apply now, right? So uh, physically come to Taiwan uh, and get to know the people who are on the civic tech uh, scene uh, and uh, propose your ideas in a presidential hackathon say uh, or in any of our like fintech sandbox and things like that and then you get to essentially break the law uh, for six months or a year uh, and try out new ways of governance within that sandbox um, uh, the caveat is that you can't experiment on money laundering or funding terrorism but everything else is fair game uh, and if it's a good idea as measured by police or other consultation uh, mechanisms then we just adopt that and you may uh, be one of the five champions each year on a presidential hackathon and have your idea turned into a presidential order. Well, that's a nice recipe there. Um, okay, so we're now at time. I, I have one more question. So, you know, I mean, now that you know the group at least a little bit and the kinds of questions that we're asking, what is the kind of question where you like, this is the total blind spot of this group. Why aren't they asking this question? Like, what, what do you want to draw our attention to that where you're just like, oh my God, they're totally drifting in the wrong direction here. Um, what's something that uh, we definitely don't know that uh, you, you think we should be just paying more attention to? Well, um, I, I think uh 
the question that I get asked uh, in this hour, I think is very well balanced. And I think uh, this is a, a bunch of people who uh, are cautious optimists about the potential of social technology, uh, which is really, really my tribe. <laughs> so so I, I don't think there's any glaring uh, blind spots or any glaring uh, misassumptions or bias that I could detect. So I would just um, do my usual thing and wish all of you live long and prosper. Thank you so much. I, 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 yeah, we can't thank you enough for joining us here for this very, very quick round. I think that was super, super refreshing. I am posting in the chat here right now um, a link to a, our gather room with the password, uh, if it, in case it prompts you still, for everyone who would like to hang on and uh, just socialize at our normal gather tables and get to know each other and the group and perhaps have some after debrief. Uh, then uh, let's meet there. Aubrey, Aubrey, I cannot, cannot thank you enough mm -hmm. from everyone here. Uh, this was really fantastic. And uh, yeah, we're hoping that we get to potentially uh, welcome you again soon. That was definitely the fastest se uh, question session I've done so far. <laughs> I didn't even get through all of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, and I saw the peace and long life from Danny in the chat. Uh, you're the third person, Danny, uh, to get this right. Okay, cheers. Well, we may see a lot of us in Taiwan uh, in the future. Okay, uh, bye. All right. See many of you on Gather. For those of you who'd like to join, uh, don't forget to quit your Jitsi as you're joining Gather. Um, and yeah, I'll see you there. And for the rest of you, I'll see you. Um, uh, in the next few weeks for our next keynote meeting. It was really lovely to have you all on. Bye-bye, everyone.